It's Sunday morning in America, and all across the country, people are going to church. In fact, Americans go to church more than any people in all other Western nations. And because of America's history, they attend a greater variety of churches than people anywhere as well. In the United States, historically, uh, anybody can sit down and read the Bible and interpret it as, they, as their conviction leads them and then stand on the back of a truck or a, or a tree stump and start preaching. And if they can get followers, they can get followers. Here, every niche, every need, every gap, whether you're looking for a market or you're out to save souls or whatever, is going to be filled by something. And if it isn't a European church, transformed in America, something new gets started. Jesus once told his disciples, in my father's house are many mansions. And many Americans have embodied this diversified vision of heaven and the way they look for churches. But how did American religion become so diverse? The answer has a lot to do with the people who came here and the policies they established. People who came to America from other lands brought their religious traditions with them. And thanks to the freedoms granted in the Bill of Rights, the government never required citizens to attend an official state-sanctioned church. So they could attend the same kind of church they had attended back home. America became a religious place and eventually a nation from the very beginning in the 1620s and thereafter. When the wave of immigrants come in the 19th century, they're fleeing the state for our state. They're fleeing states in Europe that are persecuting Catholics or that are not providing sufficient agricultural lands for people to farm or who are in other ways failing economically. So either repressive or economically depressed states are the problem and the immigrants are fleeing that and coming to this country precisely because it is a place of rights and freedoms. By the mid-1800s, most major cities had Catholic, Episcopalian, Methodist, Presbyterian, Baptist, Lutheran, and other churches, often within a few blocks of each other. A view of Cleveland from any very elevated position reveals the existence of so many church edifices that it might properly be called a city of churches. Cleveland Illustrated, 1876. But in some regions, Patterns of immigration led to the creation of religious enclaves. New York and Boston were home to many Irish Catholics. Cincinnati and St. Louis were home to German Lutherans. And many large American cities were home to African American communities. In Philadelphia, the Reverend Richard Allen founded the African Methodist Episcopal Church. People formed enclaves, cocoons, ghettos, their own parishes, their own neighborhoods, and they were very concerned about being swallowed up in a uh, homogenized, vanilla society that uh, did not respect their own particular faith, which they held very closely. For Catholics, it was not always hostile, but foreign, alien in, in religious terms. And there was a, a fair amount of hostility, and there was very little by way of pastoral support. The great cry of all the early bishops was for more priests. They simply couldn't keep up with the pastoral needs. It is important for newcomers to our shores to understand that uh, they can practice their faith and the government isn't going to stop them doing that. Or that if they were reared in a particular Christian denomination, should they convert to some other faith, they have a perfect freedom to do that. Uh, again, no one's going to say you've got to stay exactly where you started out. So I think that's a characteristic of the American polity that we tend to take for granted. But in the long span of human history, it's quite unusual. And all you have to do is look around the world today and see the many places where you, there is no religious freedom and where you pay a terrible penalty if you convert to an another faith. Your life may even be in danger. America's open, free-willing religious culture provided a welcoming environment for all kinds of religious groups. 
many of which had faced persecution in Europe. The first Amish believers came to America during colonial times. The Amish were a movement founded by Mennonites in Switzerland. Today, some 200,000 Amish live in Ohio, Pennsylvania, Indiana, and other states. Meanwhile, more than 100 Hutterite communities sprang up in the U.S. Founded in Austria in the 16th century, the disciples of Jacob Hutter practiced communal living based on the pattern in the New Testament book of Acts. Hutterite groups were persecuted in Europe but flourished in North America. America was also very fertile ground for the creation of a host of new religious movements that took traditional aspects of Christianity and added new twists. One of the most successful new groups was the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Joseph Smith was a New Yorker who claimed angels spoke to him around 1829 and revealed the location of buried scriptures known as the Book of Mormon. Today, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has 13 million members worldwide. Other new and sometimes radical groups flowered in America as well. Two unique groups sought to recreate the New Testament book of Acts on American soil. The Shakers, founded by Mother Ann Lee, practiced celibacy. Meanwhile, utopian communities like the Oneida community, founded by John Humphrey Noyes, practiced complex marriage in which every male was married to every female. Another unique group was the Millerites, who believed William Miller's claim that the world would end around 1843. Devoted Millerites gave away their homes and land and waited for the second coming of Jesus. Following the so-called Great Disappointment, Many Millerites helped found the Seventh-day Adventist Church. In the 20th century, more new groups developed, including Christian Science, Jehovah's Witnesses, and the Worldwide Church of God. And later on, other new groups included Jim Jones' People's Temple and David Koresh's Branch Davidian Group. The perceived excesses and eccentricities of these and other religious groups led some Americans to ask why the government couldn't do more to control religion. But freedom from government control of religion has become a cornerstone of the American system. Most of us have a misunderstanding about the government's role in religion. Um, it's neither to leave it alone nor to minutely interfere with it. Government has shown itself very incompetent in dealing with matters of religious belief and doctrine and practice in regulating the internal affairs of religious groups in poking into religious groups' internal life. Where government has a very real concern is if a religious group's actions uh, break the law are threatened to subvert the social order. In those kinds of cases, the government, uh, even our government in the United States, has a responsibility to move and act. But in doing so, it should act not so much against the group, but against those individuals who have broken the law and those individuals who have done things to undermine the social life of the country. Another major source of America's religious diversity was the change that took place in established groups as they tried to remain vital and relevant. Presbyterians and Baptists have divided a lot in this country. My experience and reading of Presbyterian history is that it's often been around the great confessions of faith that so shape a Presbyterian identity. So these ideas are extremely important in Presbyterian context and worth dividing over. With Baptists, you not only get the ideas, but you have a polity, a form of church government that lends itself not just to the possibility of division, but the probability. Revivals, 
are also another source that has changed the American religious landscape over the centuries. It's important to realize that revivals, or when we talk about revival, we're talking about a whole spectrum of things that went on. Lots of times people talk about revival in the present or revival in the past or revivals as if it's sort of a monolithic thing. He or she may be thinking of one sort of revival and somebody else of a different kind of revival. In the 1850s, groups like the Layman's Prayer Revival sought to introduce businessmen to Christianity. This revival ushered in a much more lay emphasis in revivalism so that it was a revival that wasn't centered around a particular revival preacher, but it was mostly through prayer, businessmen or church people at prayer. And then in the context of prayer and testimony, people were converted and um, the revival spread. And so it was a time when um, lay people realized that they could have a part in evangelism, in discipleship, and not just leave it to professional clergy, which had been a little bit more the practice uh, prior to that time. Meanwhile, men like Barton Stone, a Presbyterian, and Alexander Campbell, a Baptist, sought to return the church to its New Testament roots by creating a new Christian restoration movement. Restoration movements, plural, just proliferated on the American frontier in the early 19th century. On the one hand, you've got the Stone Campbell movement that very quickly became the fourth largest religious movement in the United States behind Baptists, Presbyterians, and Methodists. Mormons begin at the same time, they also proliferate. And then you also have numerous utopian movements like John Humphrey Noyes and his Oneida community in Oneida, New York, or the Shaker movement uh, began in New England, spread all the way out to Pleasant Hill, Kentucky. All these utopian, or many of these utopian movements thought of themselves as restoring something that was central to the primitive purity of the New Testament church. For example, the Stone Campbell movement, the number one concern was for the unity of all Christians. They were deeply grieved over the divisions that existed in Christendom in the United States. And they wondered, how can we bring Christians together? And their answer to that question was, we could bring Christians together if we focus on the things that all Christians share in common instead of the things that divide us. And they suggested that the things that divide us are our specific creeds and confessions of faith. So that, for example, the Philadelphia Confession of Faith was for the Baptists, not for the Lutherans. The Augsburg Confession was for the Lutherans, not for the Calvinists, etc. But they said the one thing we all share in common is the biblical text and the experience of the primitive church. So let's propose that we restore primitive Christianity, what we all share in common, as a means to the unification of Christians in America. At the beginning of the 20th century, the famous Azusa Street Revival in Los Angeles was one of many revivals that ushered in the modern Pentecostal movement. By mid-century, elements of Pentecostal practice and worship had spread to other Protestant and even Roman Catholic churches. These teachings began to, in some way, trickle over into the daily lives of people in these other churches. and into clergymen, they began to have these spiritual experiences of speaking in tongues and healings and uh, various other manifestations of the gifts of the Spirit. And as a result, by the mid to late 1960s, a huge charismatic movement had grown up within uh, Lutheran, Episcopal, Presbyterian uh, denominations and then over in, within the Roman Catholic Church as well. And in the 1960s, the Catholic Church sought to open the windows of church tradition and let in a rush of fresh air. The result was Vatican II, which ushered in dramatic changes in the ways Catholics worshiped and lived. As we move toward the 50s and 60s, the church universally begins to reform. So it moves away from the Latin Mass in the 1960s with the Second Vatican Council. In the late 60s, the Novus Ordo Mass in the early 70s, the Mass in English becomes widespread. But even more important than that, there was the beginning of ecumenical movement in the late 50s and 60s. That is, Catholics opening up and reaching out 
to other Christians. There was an awareness of the laity and uh, the importance of lay American Catholics in the life of the church, which de-emphasized to some degree the priesthood, which had always been a bit off-putting to Protestants. Priests continued to be important, but they were no longer seen by the 1960s as telling the laity what to do in every regard. And that signaled to people that the institution building and the politics and the economic progress of Americans was dovetailing with the progress of the Roman Catholic Church more generally. Periods of social change and turbulence forced churches to respond and address new social realities. In the case of the 1960s and 70s, changing times spawned a new movement known as the Jesus People which combined elements of the counterculture with old-time revivalistic religion. Well, the Jesus People movement came straight out of the counterculture at one level, but it was also kind of a cross-fertilization with, you know, this major movement within American culture during the 1960s, the counterculture, and its collision with evangelical Christianity at kind of the grassroots level. The Jesus movement sought to make Jesus relevant to the modern age. Along with the expansion and growth of the charismatic movement, these trends helped break down walls that worshipers believed separated them from God. It brought back a realization for a more casual authenticity in the church. It was about being serious with your faith. You know, there's got to be a genuine um, experience and a, and a real commitment to Christianity, not just a, a Sunday morning, 11 a.m. type of a faith. Meanwhile, at the same time other churches and groups try new approaches and methods, there is a renewal of interest in older, more traditional approaches to spirituality, including liturgy, monastic retreats, and centering prayer. These developments proved to be a revitalizing force within many mainstream churches. Change has been a constant within America's churches, but one powerful force for change has been the growth of parachurch organizations. A parachurch ministry is a Christian work that happens outside the formal structures of the church. These agencies where Christians would voluntarily band together to accomplish some kingdom task and to do that as a Christian society alongside of or outside of the formal church. You see these happening especially in the wake of new um, seasons of re revival and renewal. So another great wave of these are happening in the 1820s, 1830s in the United States. Some parachurch groups have been around for a century or more, like the American Bible Society and the International Bible Society, which were both founded in the early 1800s. Other parachurch groups come and go, like Promise Keepers, which was reaching millions of men in huge stadium events in the 1990s. Parachurch ministries play a wide variety of roles. If there is a, a line of Christian expression or Christian work, Christian mission, that might be accomplished. There are parachurch agencies that have been formed specifically to accomplish those things. They provide things that churches and denominational networks and fellowships were used to providing for Christian people. Over the years, parachurch groups have been created to complete specific tasks and reach specific groups. Catholic Charities USA helps nearly 8 million poor individuals and families every year. World Vision, a Protestant group, has an annual budget of nearly $1 billion and works in more than 100 countries. AIM International, formerly known as African Inland Mission, is one of hundreds of missionary organizations spreading the gospel around the world. Young Life reaches hundreds of thousands of young people every year at schools and in summer camps. Habitat for Humanity is an ecumenical Christian organization that has built more than a quarter million houses for one million people around the globe. 
The Fellowship of Christian Athletes was founded in 1954 to reach men and women who play sports in professional and amateur settings. And there are thousands more groups, large and small, that focus on other issues. Transport for Christ seeks to minister to the nation's long-haul truck drivers. The Christian Environmental Association is a network of groups promoting environmental stewardship and concern for the poor. And groups like Cowboys for Christ, Christian Bow Hunters of America, and Christian Motorcyclists Association bring faith to lifestyle and leisure activities. Some parachurch groups create radio and television programming. Well, Moody Radio consists of about 36 owned and operated stations, a network that provides programming to over 600 affiliates. Uh, we're based out of Chicago at the Moody Bible Institute, and we've been producing programming for over 80 years. Other parachurch groups roll up their sleeves and tackle local problems, like the Pacific Garden Mission, which has been helping poor and homeless people in Chicago since 1877. The main strength of parachurch ministries is that they can mobilize people and interest quickly and go after something very fast. When America's founders opened the door to religious freedom, some worried that religion would have a lessened impact on the nation. But as the past two centuries clearly show, the opposite has been the case. Because they kept God out of the Constitution, God only appears in the last line, signed in the year of our Lord, 1787. Because they kept it out, I like to say godless constitution and therefore godly people. That left a, a positive feel for religion, even though at the time only a small percentage of the members, of the residents in the country were members of churches. Um, that positive feeling then allowed church membership to grow and expand to the kind of phenomenal rate that we have today where something like 80% of the population are members of Christian churches. Voluntary, persuasive is the way a free society does it and why we've prospered considerably and I think it's our future hope.